think that's recording. Let's assume that it is. All right, cool. So um, as I said before the recording started, this is going to be a workshop on uh, science, technology, and ethics. So what I'm going to do is essentially cover what I think are the most important scientific and technological advances that are happening now or in the near future. Um, and I'm going to explain to you how I think that perhaps counterintuitively, the, the most strategic way to tackle a lot of these motions is in fact to deal with them uh, through a sort of more ethical or principled perspective, um, rather than what I think people usually try and do, or perhaps why it is that people often uh, who don't come from, you know, who don't study engineering or science or something like that, uh, often feel like they struggle with these motions because they feel like they don't understand the technologies well enough uh, to debate them. So uh, this will basically be the broad outline of this uh, workshop, which is why do we debate science and technology? Uh, I just want to talk briefly about motion strategy, um, then a little bit again briefly about principles, um, then there's going to be a big chunk on ongoing technological advancements, and then uh, as a reward for those who stick around, you're going to get uh, the secret debate strategies that I would never have revealed, uh, except I'm not doing worlds or any majors, so I don't particularly care now. Um, all right, so firstly, why do we debate uh, motions about science and technology? Uh, what is their special purpose within debating? Uh, so this is a quote by Sheng Ru Li. Uh, I don't think he said this out loud, uh, but he has a blog where he writes lots of things that uh, I agree with. Um, and so if you read the quote, it's essentially saying that uh, this is referring more to these sci-fi type debates where we're dealing with the technology or a scientific advance that's just clearly perhaps outside of the realms of you know anything that might actually happen um but the premise is the same what uh what the quote is essentially saying is uh technology is a vehicle to make things happen in a way that kind of frees us from considerations of plausibility uh what that means is if i set a motion about a, a machine that for example can record and transfer emotions uh, i'm not asking us to debate this because I think it's something that's likely to come up in the real world. I'm asking us to debate this because I want us to contemplate the philosophy of, of emotions and how we relate to one another on the basis of our inability to ever understand what another person is feeling. So you can think of these motions uh, not as who can, you know, most accurately regurgitate the, you know, the, the new scientist article they read, but instead to think of them as a, as a sort of arena for philosophy to happen. Um, and if that sounds scary, it shouldn't be, because um, as you'll see as we go through, a lot of the philosophical uh, clashes, so to speak, that will happen in these debates are not, you know, niche, like complex Kantian ethics or anything like that, but are instead like questions that we grapple with often on a day to day basis, but just on a much larger scale. So in theory, science and technology debates, if you don't adopt this perspective, can't really happen because presumably the answer to anything that we might ask in a science debate is, um, well, let's just do an experiment. Let's test it. Uh, so good, you know, if the CA is good, the motions shouldn't be about um, efficacy or what is true in science, but instead should be about questions like how do we use science? Uh, how should we restrict science? Uh, you know, how should technology um, be shared around, around society, what should technology be used for, things like that. Um, it, it, what that means, therefore, is that instead of looking and trying to focus on what it is that the technology does, although that step is important, focus instead on what it means for us um, and how it will shape society and what the trade-offs that are involved within that technology are. So that's the first thing you want to be asking yourself, basically, in prep. Every time you see a motion come up that incorporates uh, some idea of technology or science, um, stop trying to think of what are the list of uh, benefits that our side can get or harms that our side can point to um, and instead like make sure that you're immediately thinking about trade-offs and I'm going to try and make that as clear as possible as I go through all of the um, individual example uh, individual technologies but I just want to talk first about this one motion because I think it's a good uh, example of why if you try and simply list pros and cons of, of a technological you know a progression or evolution or something, um, you may discover that you're, you have a problem. So um, this is based on actually, uh, we did a master's like show round uh, uh, when I said the uh, 
Kinead College debating open or debating championship, I can't remember what it was. Uh, anyway, we did this motion um, and this broadly covers, I think, the main themes that came up in the debate. And you can see that government have, you know, a couple of harms, op have a couple of harms. And if we were on Gov, we might start connecting these together. So we might say that, you know, yes, addiction and mental health is a problem, but with that, we're going to need to compare that to the, to the benefits potentially to mental health that come from um, the ability to connect with people and to collaborate with people um, on, on, or just, you know, to talk to your friends, to, to deal with the loneliness of, you know, pandemic lockdowns, perhaps. Um, you might also say that, you know, the mental health aspect feeds into the social justice aspect. A lot of social justice movements that have evolved on uh, social media um, potentially have made things better for people and therefore have improved their mental health. Uh, you might, again, talk about how the interconnectivity has been problematic because it, it means that people are now too connected, um, but they're connected to the people they want to be connected to. They, they hear only the things they want to hear, et cetera, classic stuff. Um, you know, education, yes, we all get our news now from social media and perhaps arguably we're more informed than we've ever been, um, but a lot of the information that we get is inaccurate, et cetera. And you can keep going like this, but then eventually you get to something like privacy. And it's just not clear that it clear, like it, 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 you could definitely take privacy-based arguments in this motion and, and apply them to the other areas. But it's very much a, a distinct concept. The idea that, that social media has, has eroded our, our concept of privacy, the, the, the limits of what it is that we feel comfortable with sharing with other people, uh, or even that we know that we're sharing, uh, that's not something that I think can cl like clearly fit into the more predictable, practical, if you will, clashes. Um, and funnily enough, in that round, we analyzed privacy and we ended up winning. So maybe that's why I'm biased towards that. But I think it's, a, it's an illustration of um, if you could prove something fundamental in that in that motion, like this violates people's privacy, and that is always and everywhere wrong, regardless of how many benefits it can produce, you've automatically won. Because if you're saying that something is immoral, it would not be particularly strategic for an opposition bench to respond with, but people can like share their, you know, crocheted socks that they've knitted on Facebook and start a small business. That's not going to matter if I've proven something fundamental and moral. Okay, so hopefully that's uh, explained to you why it is that ethics and science even belong together in the first place. Um, so let's quickly talk about motion types and the different types of strategies and, and burdens that come with them. So the obvious one, we all know it, this house would policy motions, fiat, if you're regulating a technology, if you're funding a technology, whatever it is, um, once you think through the pros and cons of it and you come up with a list of arguments, make sure that you're constructing your policy, your mechanism, your model, whatever you call it, uh, to try and like, you know, boost the benefits uh, and try and reduce the harms if you're on Gov. Uh, if you're counter-propping on op, same thing. Um, remember though, because these are policy motions, we are dealing with, you know, the world as it is now and then something changing. So arguments like backlash are going to come up and you should be ready, whether that's because you're going to run backlash or because you want to be making sure that you're building in, you know, mitigation against stuff like backlash. Um, you know, if we banned Facebook now, yes, it's going to piss off a lot of people. Uh, that's something you are going to have to deal with if someone ends up setting that debate. I don't think they will, but um, this house supports and this house opposes. Obviously, there's no uh, policy. There's no model from the government bench. Instead, though, you want to be focusing on uh, characterizing what the world looks like, what the problems facing the world are, how this technology has been used so far, um, what very importantly, uh, is there anything that's like this technology that existed or exists already? And obviously you want to be talking about counterfactuals. So uh, if you oppose something coming into play, um, you're, as I said earlier, going to be dealing with trade-offs. So you want to be making sure that you're acknowledging that that thing probably has some benefit. Um, so, you know, if we're talking about AI, for example, it's going to solve a lot of problems in the world. Um, but you want to be making sure then that if you're covering all your turf, you have answers to how we might solve those problems without AI. Um, trend now, trend analysis, like where is the world currently? Where is it going? Which way will it go on either side of the debate? Stuff like that. Uh, this house prefers motions. Um, usually will be this house prefers a world. And I've got a whole slide on these because I just want to clarify something that uh, is part of the BP rules, but not everyone necessarily knows. 
because um, these motions are quite special in the sense that when you say a world where x, it, just, it means that it's to some extent always been like that, uh, or at least has has been like that for as long as makes sense. So an example is this house prefers a world without social media. You, you obviously don't want to start anal your analysis of the counterfactual history uh, in you know, an early civilization because they didn't have electricity. Start in the mid 2000s, that will make sense. Uh, if it was a world without electricity, you can go back to the 1800s. If it was a world where we never invented the wheel, uh, then yeah, you want to go back to the dawn of civilization. Um, but the point is you can make very powerful arguments, and a lot of teams don't do this in these motions, by simply going, if we look back at the start of society where this motion makes sense, do things even, if, like, do, does society evolve in the same way that we are used to it now? Because what a lot of people do that's incorrect is they're just like, what if the world was like it is now and then from tomorrow this thing was different that's not that's not appropriate because if that was the debate the cas wanted you to have they would have used you know a magical technology to just make it like that or they would talk about banning it or whatever um so the the the, the critical thing that you need to remember here is that because we're not restricting or um introducing anything into society it's assumed to have always been that way or as long as it, it had been that way for as long as it makes sense we can also assume that people will be used to it. So if, for example, the motion is one of the more sci-fi ones, but it's like, you know, uh, all people are born with the ability to teleport or something like that. I think that actually did get set at a competition last year. Um, then, you you know, you you it's not going to be shocking to people that they can teleport because everyone can teleport and everyone's used to the idea that everyone can teleport. Um, silly example, but bear this in mind when you're preparing for these motions. Okay. Uh, let's dive into um, examples of, okay, quick question. Um, so the question is, uh, in this house opposes, why is it not enough for prop to only show the reasons for opposing this and not give a counterfactual telling what they support? Um, I mean, you don't have to give a counterfactual. I just think it's very useful because you can never, you, like in debating, you should never be saying this thing is bad. Instead, you should be saying, this thing is worse than. Um, and therefore, if we oppose something, we must presumably, given what I said earlier, which is that if you are doing debating in general correctly, you're going to have to accept that there'll be trade offs. There's no, you know, it, if the CAs have done their job properly, there'll be arguments on both sides. And you want to be making sure that you are comparing your best material against what is some arguments that they're going to have that you can't fully contradict. Um, so a counterfactual is important because then it's like, well, not this thing is bad. And if it stops, then it, that bad thing will stop because presumably they'll have good things that it does. So you want to be making sure that you have a counterfactual that is that you can compare to. And that allows you to say, literally lets you say the words, and this world would be better than the world that we're going to end up living thanks to this technology. So, um, the thing I, oh, the thing I really wanted to flag as well is, uh, beyond just like these being very cool motions, they come up at majors a lot. All of the examples that I've listed here were from uh, recent Worlds uh, or Euros competitions. Uh, and I know I've also got motions throughout the talk from, you know, ABP, uh, Austral's, pre-career, technically Worlds, but um, so these motions do come up. So if you are currently preparing for like a big major like Worlds, these types of motions frequently do come up. Um, so it is worth getting good at them. Cool. Um, I'm not going to dwell on these because we are going to come back to these uh, at the end. But I think like it's worth if you are making a case file, whether mentally or literally on paper, uh, mentally like classifying different types of principle clashes, um, and then thinking about how they apply to these kind of motions will get you in the mindset of more quickly, you know, jumping to the the, the core of the debate as quickly as possible instead of just coming up with sort of individual arguments that produce individual impacts because then you'll have a list of benefits and another team maybe in closing will come along and say here's something very universal about the motion um this is actually a debate about privacy versus security maybe for example we're debating uh, facial recognition technology or something like that or freedom versus safety a lot of these things um you know can sound quite similar um and often it's just the the nuance of what the motion is in particular is saying um you know, bodily autonomy also comes up a lot in science debates because obviously technology is often something that we use personally, 
uh, and therefore we're choosing to do it, uh, to use it. And so it might seem intuitive that, well, surely it's our choice. Um, so the, the, and then of course, agency and coercion. Um, you want to be ready to analyze why it is that something coerces someone's choices in a way that means they're no longer really free in the decisions that they're making. That kind of, these kind of, uh, you know, principal clashes are going to come up a lot, and it's it's very useful to be prepared and have that analysis in your mind. Um, but as I say, that's mostly outside the scope of this talk. Okay, now on to the uh, the. This is going to be a fairly meaty chunk on a lot of what I think are very cool technologies uh, that are currently ongoing. A lot of stuff you will have heard about, you will have seen in the news, potentially even seen motions on. So let's delve into them. Um, this one I, I put in, it's not like sci-fi, or but it is very relevant right now. And I've seen motions come up on vaccines. And you know what? This is probably the least useful to debating, but it would also be pretty useful to know in general, given you know the world right now. Um, so what are vaccines and how do they work? Uh, the basic premise is that your body has the immune system, um, which is a essentially a series of different biochemical mechanisms that enable the body to detect when it's been uh, invaded by some sort of uh, hostile external organism, uh, i.e. you know you breathe in a virus, your body needs to recognize that there is a virus and recognize that, that virus is not part of you. And it's very important that it recognizes that the virus is not part of you but doesn't also accidentally think your own cells are part of you because then it would start attacking your own body as well as happens in like organ transplants. Um, so the immune system, though, is, is a sort of very creative uh, system. It can respond to new threats because otherwise it wouldn't be very good because it would only, you know, it, it, it would be pre-programmed perhaps to solve a bunch of different diseases and then a new one comes along and the human race would be wiped out. So we evolved to, all, all species evolved to be able to deal with uh, new kind of infections um, by basically learning how to deal with them. But that learning process of how to deal with a new infection can be quite slow. Um, and if it's too slow, then you die. So the goal of vaccines is to speed up that process by giving you a fake illness, so to speak, um, that trains the immune system uh, so that the next time you get infected with something that is, the, you know, the vaccine should be very similar uh, to the thing that you're trying to vaccinate against, the virus, the bacteria, whatever. Um, in a way that the immune system next time is ready and responds much quicker, potentially so quickly that you never even get ill. Um, so a, a number of different ways to do that. The word microorganism here, you can just think of as bacteria, virus, something very small. So some types of vaccines are uh, inactivated. So you get, for example, the virus molecule and you, you find some way to kill it, so to speak. That word's a bit weird because viruses aren't technically alive in any sense that we typically think of life uh but whatever you you kill it so the the virus can't you know replicate or can't cause harm anymore um and then you inject a, a big dose of them and then the immune system uh responds as if the viruses were alive because it doesn't know that they're dead but it remembers them and then next time the same virus comes in but is alive the immune system kicks in um much quicker uh, another way you might do this is instead of killing it outright, you just make it very weak so that there's no risk of it infecting a person, um, but it still behaves in the same way as it would as if you, you know, it was a live, um, a live infection. Uh, another type of vaccine is where you take a subunit. So rather than taking the whole virus, for example, the whole bacteria, you just take a, a chunk of it because the immune system doesn't need to recognize the whole thing. If it knows that this chunk means that the rest of it's there, then it will behave in the same way. Um, and, and the uh, very topical one, if you know the Pfizer vaccine is an mRNA vaccine, they work by essentially mimicking the uh, genetic code. So remember I said that your, body, your immune system needs to know when it's your own body so that it doesn't kill off your own cells. Um, it does this through recognizing the genetics. And so if you can introduce the genetics of a virus, um, that can be used by the immune system in order to uh, you know, ready itself in the future for when the actual virus hits you. So, you know, in terms of the debates, then independently of the science, um, well, they, they, they connect with one another, but the things that we need to, you know, consider when it comes to different vaccines or vaccines, you know, uh, particularly in the current context where we have like, I don't know, 
I've lost track at this point, like eight, something like eight different vaccines that are going around the world. What, what is it that makes them different? Why would, we, why would we want eight different ones? Do they serve different roles, et cetera? Uh, so the first thing to understand is that saying that it, it, it triggers an immune response, teaches your body to respond to a virus or bacteria, um, it doesn't tell you very much on its own because the different vaccines can produce different lengths of immunity. Um, that's why you have to take two vaccine shots. Um, there's also a degree of immunity. So whether or not you get enough of an immune response so that you just don't get ill the next time, or whether you get enough of an immune response that stops you being hospitalized or dying, but you still get very ill, uh, that's uh, a valid consideration as well for different. Um, this fancy word valency, it just means if you give this vaccine, will it work if the virus mutates? So flu, for example, is a absolute nightmare from a uh, immunology perspective, because every uh, flu, the flu virus mutates so quickly that every time we create a vaccine, within a couple of months, it's mutated enough that the old vaccine doesn't work. So COVID right now is where we're still kind of holding our breath and waiting to see whether or not the vaccines we've created will work against the mutations. And beyond this stuff, there's stuff like, you know, the cost of production, um, the complexity of production, uh, because of the things that I talked about previously are much more complicated than just taking two chemicals and mixing them in a pot. We're dealing with very advanced technological processes. Um, it's not something that all countries have the equipment to do. So as you see in this chart in the bottom right, uh, this is something like 99% of the world's production of, of, of COVID vaccines is happening in six countries. And um, with the somewhat exception of India, these are all relatively rich, powerful economies. Um, so the, the, there's a lot of like political implications to this. There's other stuff like the ease of transport uh, and you know side effects, but I think that typically tends to be less important. Okay, the unless there's any questions about vaccines, anything anyone ever wanted to know about vaccines, uh, we'll move on to machine learning and AI. I'll just leave a quick pause if anyone wants. Feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions, especially if you've just joined, because I know I said this at the beginning. Okay, no questions. Cool. Um, so, yeah, go for it. Yeah, unmute yourself. Oh, I didn't realize people couldn't unmute themselves. Yeah, if we could change the, um, I don't know if I can, oh, security. Yeah, I can unmute myself now. Yeah, so uh, my question is that, is there some like standard limit on the pricing of the vaccine or like, or just generally is the price of the vaccine affected by where it is produced and stuff like that? Uh, it's an excellent question um, because so let, I just want to go back a slide a second. Um, so we've, I don't know in different countries what the sort of news is saying uh, or even, you know, what the common vaccines are. But there's there's kind of like, in Europe at least, it's mostly, and in America as well, it's, it's mostly the discussion is happening between the Pfizer vaccine uh, and the uh, AstraZeneca or the Oxford vaccine, as it's known. Um, and the Pfizer vaccine is more effective uh, but it's also a lot more expensive to produce. And cr critically, it's not just that it's more expensive to produce, it's also that it has to be kept very, very cold. Um, if you let it warm up to, to like room temperature, the, the vaccine is destroyed within a few minutes. You need to get it from a freezer into a person, not even a freezer, it needs to be colder than a freezer. Um, so, so that vaccine is very effective. Uh, it seems to be quite good at, at dealing with uh, mutations of COVID as well. But unless you happen to live in a country where it's being made, like the USA uh, or South Korea, I think, uh, has some manufacturing sites there. Germany definitely does. And the UK, I'm not 100% sure. The USA is the big one, though. Um, if you live in a country that can produce the Pfizer vaccine, great. Uh, if you uh, don't, then you're left with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which works also incredibly well, um, but has the benefit of being cheap to produce um, and also being very easy to transport. Um, but there is, of course, yeah, I mean, it's only like, you know, the Pfizer vaccine is like 99% effective. The Oxford one is like 95% effective, effective, 
do we really care? Um, but there is questions that are, you know, that is indeed an ethical question. Is it acceptable that just by virtue of living in rich, advanced countries, people are getting access to what is essentially a high level of safety and security? Um, yeah. Uh, vaccines, do, uh, question, do vaccines come under med medical ethics? Uh, I think it would depend on the question. Uh, if you have a specific question in mind, then... Um, Uh, yeah, so the uh, so uh, the, got a question in direct message, so you guys won't see it, but it said so basically the maintenance of the vaccine impacts the price of the vaccines too. Uh, yeah, um, and, and in fact, in the case of the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, sorry, I, I meant to mention this originally, uh, AstraZeneca agreed to produce it, the vaccine at like zero profit. So the, because it was a collaboration with Oxford University, which at Oxford University obviously is like a non-profit because it's a university. So they were like, well, we're not going to hand over all our cutting edge research to AstraZeneca and then they'll scoop billions off this. Uh, so the, the agreement was that it would be produced at a non, uh, like zero profit. Uh, Pfizer is being sold at a huge profit on the other hand. Uh, so um, how about medical ethics when vaccination is mandated? Oh, actually... I'm really, I, now you mention it, I'm really like those debates have kind of fallen out of fashion, I think, because they were very common, like before I started, like five years ago. Um, but they've not been around for a while, but maybe they'll come back. I don't know. I think it's like, I'm not going to go into detail in the analysis, but the question that you probably want to be asking in that debate is something along the line, because, because, all right, here's the thing. If you try and argue that vaccines are in somehow, in some way dangerous, um like firstly they're not um but that's like a scientific question and you know we have no evidence that any of vaccines currently being used are particularly dangerous nor do we have any evidence of any historical vaccines being particularly dangerous if you try and argue that people have the right to opt out of vaccines because there's a risk you're going to get called out and you're probably going to lose but it doesn't really matter because something being a perceived risk by people if someone feels threatened by something um that's still meaningful their emotions count um and so these debates are then become a question of um how much should we prioritize people's right to feel safe to feel in control of their own lives to not feel like the government is forcing them to do something that they believe is, is going to harm them versus the the duty of governments to protect society at large because of course every person who doesn't get vaccinated uh, is a threat to other people as well. So in that debate, what you're looking at is like, is it okay to sacrifice the the independence, the autonomy of a small, like a small group of people for the greater good, um, which are, you know, lots of good debates, uh, sorry, lots of good workshops about, um, you know, the, this kind of principled clash. Uh, we'll, we can talk about it if we have some time at the end. Let's, uh, let's delve into machine learning for now. Uh, yeah, bodily autonomy would be you know the 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 buzzword to go and research if you want to prepare for that kind of debate so all right so ai and machine learning uh sometimes people just talk about ai sometimes they talk about both and confuse them so what i want to do here is i want to just clearly separate them out and hopefully provide you with some, a, a better insight into what it is that they both mean and what they will mean in the future so machine learning is uh well, th these are all, uh, both of them are examples of computational intelligence. So it's where um, rather than the way we've historically used computers, which is you put in, say, a number and another number and you add it together and you get an answer, um, computers have always, it, it, throughout our history, dealt with uh, quantitative problems, typically. Um, problems that just involve more maths than a human can do. Um, and it was a barrier for a very long time to have computers to be able to solve questions like, if you show a computer a picture of a car, can it tell that it's a car or does it just spit out, you know, the binary string of the colors? Um, so that, that we there was a long period of time where we, we used computers to do maths, basically, and that was it. I mean, technically, machine learning and AI is still maths, but it, but it's evolved past what we consider the historical role of computers. Uh, into something, you know, much more impactful. Um, so what machine learning does is it takes data, um, it analyzes that data, and then it uses statistics and very advanced mathematics um, 
to make predictions about the same type of problem, and I'll explain what I mean by problems in a second, but with unknown data. So what that means is I could construct a machine learning algorithm where I show it a thousand pictures of cars, all different uh, uh, shapes, sizes, brands, you know, different quality images, different angles of the car, et cetera, just a thousand images of a car. And then I could take that, that algorithm I've made and I could show it a, a picture of, I don't know, a dog and, a, and a, one of them a car and not tell it which one is which, but because it's learned from the past data, it can tell you this is a car, this is not a car. If I built a more complex model that could learn, that could identify cars and dogs, then it might be able to say car, dog. Um, so that's what machine learning does. And that sounds very simple, but it's actually incredibly difficult because what you have to do is take the completely abstract process of human learning, which is that like, if I asked you to describe um, a car, uh, you would probably say, oh, well, it's a, you know, it's a vehicle that people sit in and it has four wheels and a, and a combustion engine or a motor of some sort. Um, and then, you know, if you had an annoying five-year-old, they might, they might show you a quad bike and they'll say, well, there's a quad bike, a car then. And you go, well, no, okay, that's a, that's, a, that's a quad bike. It's something different. And they go, well, it has four wheels and you drive it around. It has a motor. Why is it different? And then you would start to be like, mm, okay, this is getting complicated. Is a bus a car? Um, is a van a car? Uh, so the problem you're dealing with basically is we have these like abstract models in our brain that we don't really understand how they work. And so if we want to teach computers to think that way, we're stuck because we don't know how our own brains work. How the hell are we going to teach a computer to think like that? So machine learning um, avoids this problem by basically uh, allowing machines to learn how they want to learn. Uh, we just give them the tools to do it. So that's what I mean by uh, problems. So the problem is, for example, identification of images, sounds, or text, or um, other types of algorithms that we'll talk about later. So what's that, what, how is that different to artificial intelligence? Um, well, because the machine learning algorithm is only ever solving the type of problem that I trained it to solve. It's not actually learned to solve problems in general, it's learned to solve that problem. I know what I'm saying probably might be confusing. Um, so if you are confused by what I just said, uh, feel free to drop me a DM and I'll just explain it my, a, a, again, but um, otherwise I'm gonna continue under the assumption that I'm sufficiently clear. So an artificial intelligence is something that we would we construct not to um, like deal with individualized problems, but instead to develop problem solving techniques in general that it can apply to wider classes of problems. So to give you an example, it would be very possible by showing, say, uh, lots and lots of pictures of chess boards in different, you know, pieces in different positions. Um, and then, you know, uh, so you show it what the board was, and then you show it, for example, what like a grandmaster chess player, what move they made. And if it learned from enough grandmaster chess players, a machine learning algorithm could tell you, here's the best move. But it couldn't play an entire game of chess because that now is not just one step, but it's like a, a, a lot of interconnected steps. It would need to strategize. It would need to plan. It would need to predict. It would need to be doing more than one type of problem at once. So that's what an artificial intelligence is. It's where it learns to solve uh, lots of different problems, but then it can mix and match the different solutions that it or, or the different methods that it has, if, even if you give it a new problem. So you could create an artificial intelligence and then you could give it a fresh game of chess and it could play all the way through because it's, it's learned like to play chess, not just to recognize good chess moves. That's the difference. It's very hard to uh, like explain exactly, you know, why that's so important, that distinction. But I'll try and um, explain as we go through some examples in the next slide. Um, there's one more thing that I want to cover, which is closer to the like sci-fi AI or the AI that I think people are imagining when they think of AI. Um, which is what's called a general artificial intelligence. Um, and this is where the word intelligence starts to come on to, uh, come close to something that like we think of as intelligence as humans. Um, it's where you could give new entirely new classes of problems uh, to the AI and it could still learn to solve them. So 
I can train an artificial intelligence to play chess, but if I you know, gave it a monopoly board, it would be lost. Um, a general artificial intelligence, though, would be able to learn in general, and therefore you could give it a new game that it's never played before or a new problem that it's never seen before, and it would be able to sort of analyze whether or not some of the th methods that it's used in the past uh, can be used for this new problem or to invent new ways of solving problems and that's really where like the big um you, you know the, the the potential for ai to become really really transformative um is where currently everything including artificial intelligence the, the first type that i talked about and including machine learning we're still limited by teaching computers to solve problems the way humans solve problems once we go past the point of standard uh, sort of single artificial intelligence to general artificial intelligence computers will be solving problems without human that humans have in ways that humans have never done before and at that point we start to things start to get really um murky in two ways one of which someone i'm really glad has flagged in in the comments uh in the message to me okay uh so some good questions there. i'll i'll okay i'll deal with the uh explaining of the ai again Okay, so um, a, a, a class just means uh, a, a grouping of, so, so for, okay, so firstly a problem is like, if I give, if I give you some set of choices, uh, can you make the right choice? That's broadly what a problem is. Um, so if I give you two images, one of a dog, one of a car, uh, can you pick the dog, the dog out of the two? That's problem solving. Um, the, if I was like, can you uh, pick the uh, pick a dog out of the images and a car out of the images? Those are two different problems, but they're in the same class, image recognition. Uh, if you then uh, say like, can you draw a car? That is a new class of problem um, because it's creation as opposed to recognition. So um, an AI, uh, is able to solve new problems that you've not explicitly taught it to solve. So whereas in a machine learning algorithm, if I wanted it to be able to recognize cars, buses, quad bikes, dogs, cats, I have to individually teach it to do all of those things. Um, an AI would be able to learn some of those things and then use what it learned about those things to, to be able to solve the problem of identifying things that I didn't explicitly teach it to solve um, even though it's never been taught to do that thing, but within the same class, i.e. image recognition or chess moves or drawing or whatever. So that's a class of problems. Um, hopefully, I think, hopefully that clears it up uh, what, what I mean by classes of problems uh, and therefore what makes AI different to machine learning. Uh, so, so we need AI. Machine learning is not sufficient for self-driving cars, for example, because a machine learning algorithm you know, you can teach it a lot, but eventually it will come into problems that it's never dealt with before. You know, some unique car crash, a clown jumps out in front of a bus, something like that that was never in its the data that you taught it. And it needs to be able to make decisions that are within the same class, which way do I drive, but that it has not explicitly been taught. Um, okay, hopefully that clears up what AI is. General artificial intelligence uh, would be able to learn outside of one class so you could teach it to drive and then if it learned enough skills from driving it could maybe also draw i don't know something like that um it, it's we don't really know because it's not really been done yet uh so there's a couple of problems with this one we if we don't know how it's solving problems then we also don't know if they're good solutions you'll see what i mean by good solutions in a second um the second is we start to get into like metaphysical ethics, but it's still worth considering, which is, so I think it's called like Searle's box or something like that. If someone remembers the name of the thought experiment, once I explain it, hopefully they can send it to me or type it in the chat or something. Um, so let's say that you were like, I don't know, in a prison cell and there's a, a small hole in the wall uh, into the cell next to you. Um, and I, I'm not giving the original version, I'm giving a simplified version to speed things up. Um, one day out of boredom, you write something on a piece of paper, 
uh, and you post it through the wall uh, and suddenly, like, I don't know, 10 minutes later, a piece of paper comes back and it's a reply to whatever you'd written. And you started asking it questions and through the process of, of like exchanging letters through the hole in the wall, you know, you grew like an emotional attachment to the person, as you, you learned about their life, their hopes, their dreams, their desires, um, you would probably feel like they were deserving of some protections. Like if you knew that something awful was going to happen to the room next to you, you would feel bad. You would, you have essentially ascribed a humanity to, to the person that you're interacting with through the hole in the wall, even though you've never seen them, touch them, or really know that they exist. If it then turned out that all that time you'd just been exchanging letters with a with a very advanced AI, you know, you might instinctively go, well, okay, then I stopped caring about it. But why? Because if the thing that made you care about it was its capacity to demonstrate humanity, to form an emotional bond with you, the fact that it's made out of silicon and, and, and copper wires, as opposed to like fleshy neurons, <laughs> is a pretty meaningless distinction if you think about it. So there is an ethical question that comes with AI as well, which is at a certain point, if something is so intelligent and, and is able to, you know, because the key thing I'm, po I'm pointing you to here is that general artificial intelligence can come up with new solutions. So at a certain point, if it is creating things of its own, it is functionally human, uh, or at least exhibits the, the things that we care about when, when we say that people are human. Um, you know, the capacity to dream, to, to imagine, to, to hope, to feel emotions, etc. It's possible that a general AI could do all of these things. And so we start to get into a very murky ethics discussion of whether or not it's even legitimate to treat AI like something that, you know, like a tool that we want to use, because at a certain point, it becomes something that maybe deserves rights. No clear answers here. Lots of great, lot, sorry, lots of great debates, though. Okay, so, um, Let's now talk about, let's go back to machine learning because this is the one that exists now, is being used right now, uh, and is being used more and more, and therefore is probably the most important in terms of, um, you know, debates that are likely to come up, but also potentially like debates that are not just about machine learning. You could probably bring machine learning in. We'll see. Um, so machine learning, as I described it thus far, sounds pretty useful. What are the issues? Well, um, what it's doing is making statistical predictions. It's not actually learning, because that would be something more like the general AI. It, it's learning in the sense that we use the word to mean it can solve the problems that we give it. But what if the underlying data that you feed it uh, like, is flawed in some sense, uh, or contains unintended correlations? So what I mean by that is, uh, this is a true case study, a true thing that happened. They created a, not very complicated, but like, you know, we, it's fair to call it machine learning algorithm um, in a city in Florida that would basically look at past crimes that had occurred and then uh, tell the police where it is they should be patrolling in order to try and catch or to prevent the most crime. So they did, they fed in the data, told them go here, here and here. They went there, they started catching more criminals. Uh, and they were like, great, it's working. Um, and then eventually someone pointed out uh, yeah, so your police force has historically been racist. They've patrolled majority, like, you know, ethnic minority areas where people are in poverty and desperate, where they catch criminals. Those criminals go to jail, get a criminal record, can't get a job, have to commit more crime to survive. Um, all of that's now wrapped up in the data, which means that you're continuing to police and repeat that problem. And it doesn't necessarily mean that this is the way to minimize crime. It's just that the, the, the data has pointed you in a direction that was shaped by the data that you had available. It wasn't actually telling you, here's where all the crime was. It was telling you, here's where you caught crime in the past. So as a result, if you're not careful about the data that you're feeding into your algorithms, um, then you are likely to make very uh, like bad uh, solutions. This is what I was pointing to earlier, bad solutions. Here's an example. Um, they wanted to see like more advanced machine learning algorithm research now focuses on like what are the limits of machine learning like how far can we push this uh and, and so they asked it like really hard problems like okay i just want to see if anyone can come up with anything 
how would you tell the difference? If I, if I showed you a picture of a wolf and a picture of a dog, how would you describe the difference between them? What would you be looking for? The structure of their faces. I think wolves have like a sharper structure maybe, and maybe a smaller snout, not sure. Yeah, yeah. but it's like, you're right, but how, what does it mean to be sharper? Uh, like, the, the, again, the, again, like your answer is perfectly correct. It makes sense to another human, but if you need to teach a machine, very complicated because these are concepts that we have, but not things that we can turn into data. It's not like, it would be very easy to say brown dog versus, uh, you know, blonde dog. That is something that I can put in maths very simply, but wolf versus dog, very hard problem for machines to deal with. So they were like, well, well, can this new, very complex, very clever machine learning algorithm we've created, can it tell the difference between dogs and wolves? And they were shocked to discover, I mean, they were expecting it to get it to, to predict the wolves correctly, like three quarters of the time. And it was getting it like 90% of the time. So they went, hmm, okay, that doesn't sound quite right. So they said, so they, they, they sort of delved into the maths and, and pulled out what it was that, that the algorithm was focusing on. And it looked like this. Can anyone figure out what happened? <laughs> so the picture on the right is what, so the picture on the left is the data that went into the machine learning algorithm. The picture on the right is what it was focusing on. Okay, so uh, the problem they discovered was that most of the pictures they had of wolves were taken in the snow. Uh, so the when it saw lots of white, the machine learning algorithm went, ah, that's a wolf. And it, it hadn't learned wolves at all. It had learned that wolves happened, that photos of wolves tend to be taken in snowy places. Uh, and so it was associating the snow with wolves correctly, um, but that didn't mean it had learned what wolves were. It had learned how to tell you based on the data that you feed it, which one is the wolf, which is not very useful. Um, so that's, uh, that's, you know, you can imagine now if you're using machine learning algorithms to predict who's more likely to be a criminal, uh, you know, who, which people should get into university because they're going to go on to make, you know, achieve great careers or whatever. As soon as you start to realize that these are the kind of questions that people are starting, or, you know, who should we hire for this job? When you realize these are the kind of questions that people are, are starting to ask machine learning algorithms, you can start to see why that might be a problem. Um, uh, Ron, can I add? Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask, like, uh, usually, like, algorithms are also, like, uh, criticized for, being, for having the racial bias as well. So, like, maybe, uh, like, them being able to identify there's, like, certain shape, uh, like, a, a shape of eyes that uh, some people, like, so, like, Asians have a different kind of, uh, like, uh, different kinds of eyes and, like, uh, like people, like, uh, white people have different kind of eyes. So, like, maybe they're, the AI is able to, like, identified uh, identified different races in like these ways as well and like maybe that would like re replicate in the case of animals as well uh sorry i'm not sure if i understand the question are you saying that we could like fix the problems of machine learning by you know adding more information into it is that is that what you meant not entirely like solving the problems but like how uh, ai does, like how it, it actually uh, does have this kind of like uh, ways of identifying how to differentiate between like different people or uh, like uh, even maybe different animals in that case as well no? oh i mean yeah so so if you for example what they did then with in this paper is they said they, they went back to the model and told it to ignore things that were white um and then it was able to just about tell the difference, but it was like really bad at it. It was getting it right like 55% of the time, which is like basically not much better than guessing. Um, but you know, if they gave it more information, eventually it would get better and better. The more information you feed an algorithm, uh, the, the, the better it can get. But there's, a, there's another problem, which is quite technical, but is something that pops up a lot, uh, which is called overfitting, which is if you have data that is noisy i.e your ability to measure things is not perfect and you demand very high levels of accuracy from your algorithm it will produce what are mathematically logical patterns but which obviously don't fit with you know 
reality. So this illustrates what I'm talking about, this, these graphs over here. Um, cool. All right. So um, not very sure if, sorry to interrupt, but I think that's also a prototype problem. What you have as an example for your algorithm or machine learning, where usually like even having male body prototypes in cars or just having white people in face recognition technologies of what Tanya was talking about. So I think these problems are a bit different from the wolf recognition problem. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, if you've, if you're, facial recognition uh, uh, algorithm was trained exclusively. Uh, there was an interesting example of this. Um, so I, 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 rem I can't remember if this was, if this actually happened or if it was just theorized that it could happen, but it was something like in, because all of the, initially when they were designing the Tesla self-driving AI, all of the people who worked with Tesla, not all of them, but most of the like, AI developers or, or uh, engineers, most of them were white. And so they were the people that were used for the initial testing. And then someone pointed out that like the AI might literally not see a black person as a person, not because it was racist, but because it had been exclusively trained on white people. And that if they didn't like make a point of including, um, you know, the pe people of different like racial groups within the training data, uh, then it was going to like just go out and like, run over people I don't remember I think maybe like I don't remember the details of the story maybe there was an accident and that's how they realized but that seems unlikely this is a well-known problem anyway you can do what I just described what I just said though to fix this so you can say like okay well if we want our facial recognition or self-driving AI or whatever it is if we want it to be good we need to make sure that it that we're thinking about these problems that will crop up um and if you do that and, and you make sure that you're not like you, nonsensical learning or, or overfitting you can create very great models like um uh i won't say their name because i don't know if like they want this to be public knowledge but there's a very famous successful debater who works for a company now um predicting where like hurricanes and typhoons will strike um using machine learning essentially um and this is really incredibly useful because whenever we deal with something that's just too complex for a human to process like weather um a machine learning algorithm can deal with infinitely complex problems as long as you give it enough computing power um it can also notice things uh and connections between things that humans could never possibly uh like notice so for medical diagnosis for example if you think about it it's like quite medieval that you get an x-ray scan and a doctor looks at some gray lumps and goes mm, yep that's cancer like <laughs> it's it's like humans we've done pretty well but it's it's pretty primitive right uh so these kind of things using machine learning for for good is going to be massively beneficial um but it's being used for bad a lot too so uh psychological profiling is something that it turns out machine learning algorithms are very good at doing so you've probably all heard of cambridge analytica the uh sort of data science machine learning company that would use social media data um, to build a uh, what was called a psychographic profile of a person. So what that means is you you take features of human personality uh, and then you like compare people on them and then you can build up like a, a sort of numerical measure of a person's personality. That's very vague. So like if you can guys can see on the stream, so like this person, I don't know if they're real or not. Um, you know, it says that they are, Let's have a look. 97% uh, intellect, so they're pretty smart. 85% uh, dutiful, so like they do what they're told kind of thing. Self-discipline, 96%. Um, cheerfulness, 39%, probably a bit dry. Excitement seeking, 16%. Yeah, okay, this person, you know, from, from looking at this chart, which was constructed presumably from their social media profile, I can already start building up like a mental image of what this person is like. Not like what they look like or, or you know what they post on social media but what they are actually like and the way this is done is very very clever and very scary it's things like so facebook does this i don't know if you've ever noticed where you're scrolling through your feed and you suddenly notice a post of someone that you've not thought about in years and you're like you just like pause for a split second just to scan the post to read it to look at the like the photo and then you keep going and it, it doesn't even register in your brain that that happened because it was like a split second pause, keep scrolling. 
but the but the 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 social media app and the machine learning algorithms they noticed and now suddenly you'll see loads more photos uh from that person that that person's posting because it's worked out that it thinks that your pause was just long enough to indicate that you're interested in finding out more about this person um right now apply that to what news stories you, you pause over what posts you like what groups you're a part of how often you comment on different groups uh, how much time you spend like within different groups um when those groups like start to have psychological implications for example if you obsessively read every single bbc world news article about covid and the war in ethiopia and whatever else then it might decide you're an anxious per person it's probably correct it wouldn't be making that on its just that it would be using that in combination with lots of other things including things like for example how steady is your hand when you use your mouse how much does your phone shake when you read a scary story? Things that you don't even know you're doing, it can pick up on all of these things and build up a, a profile of who you are as a person. And then uh, they were then using this information basically to construct political adverts that were perfectly targeted. So that instead of having you know one advert that you roll out so that millions of people see the same advert, you have thousands of each individually tweaked adverts so that each person sees the advert that is just right for them. Um, and as you can imagine, in a political campaign, that's very useful. Oh, this person's really like, you know, driven, motivated by love for their family. Okay, well, then we'll make sure that they see adverts that like show our preferred political, oh, who gives a shit, it was Donald Trump. Um, we'll show Donald Trump hugging his son or something like that in the advert. And then that will connect with that person's mental image of like them being a family person. Donald Trump is a family person. I want to vote for Donald Trump person's paranoid show them you know a scary picture of like a robber breaking through their window and say that democrats want to take away their guns stuff like this um that's so much more powerful than traditional advertising in which you had one message that went out to everyone and you just had to hope that it appealed to most of them and didn't make half of them hate you um and that's why uh i wonder if yeah so um in the top right here this is a map all the countries in pink are countries where experts reckon elections uh have been tipped like the, the result was changed by cambridge analytica not not machine learning in general just cambridge analytica um so the u.s election brexit uh italian elections um i don't know too much about south asia so i'm not going to comment but apparent but basically they've been working for anyone that will pay them uh so what machine learning the thing i want you to take away here is that a lot of the debate around machine learning is, is also a debate around data the more data you have the more accurate your models become and the more accurate your models become the more power you have over people if you're the company with all of the marketing data um or, or all of people you know you know for, if you're amazon for example you know most of what people at least in the west i guess have bought for like the last couple of years you know exactly what products to make, how to advertise them, how much to price them, et cetera, far more than your competitors who are just guessing. Uh, and that means that the companies who own the data essentially have, it, it, it's not even an advantage. It's like near automatic victory. And if you want to compete, you need to also buy that data. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, um, that's uh, I think that's the, the, the crux of machine learning. And this graph, uh, down here on the right includes Facebook, Apple, um, Amazon, Google. Yeah, those. Um, and it shows the share of the S&P 500, which is the stock market, uh, like sorry, the top 500 companies in the US stock market, uh, showing the percentage share of them. So in the space of about th four years, they went from 12 to 22 percent of the top like share of the top 500 companies uh, on the US stock market. Bear in mind, though, that the US economy also grew really fast during that time. So that means that the value of these companies has exploded in the last five years because people now realized uh, data is the future and machine learning is going to change the world. And that's before we even get to AI, let alone general AI. So, yeah. Um, cool. Um, all right. Genetics. We're going to switch back to more biology now. If you're you know maths and computer science is not your thing uh although as you're about to discover the two are merging together 
so the thing that I want to get across with um, genetic engineering and genetic sequencing is uh, if you don't study biochemistry or you don't have you know haven't read much about it, uh, I think people have a very distorted view of what genetic engineering can actually do. I think getting that right <laughs> will probably win you at least a couple of debates because I promise you some team will panic and argue that like we're going to have mutants like X-Men and people growing extra arms and you know the rich are going to make their babies super smart and all that like none of that's going to happen in not in the near future anyway one day maybe but not for a while um okay so what, what do the genes do uh each gene is a code so your dna lots and lots of genes connected together each gene makes a protein a protein is like a a, a bigger complicated molecule that does something that something can be quite literally anything within the realms of chemistry um so they can proteins can form building blocks for cells you know like your your skin is made of proteins your eyes your hair your entire body is made of proteins but it can also modify the behavior of proteins so for example we all know that you know, if, if you go out in the sun for a while your skin starts to darken that's due to proteins being released that produce protein uh, produce chemicals that protect your skin against uv radiation um all of that everything that your body does is built upon genes but each gene produces one protein. Um, now there are a lot of proteins. Uh, 20,000 unique proteins is the current number and we know that number's wrong um, because we just starting to scratch the surface of genetic sequencing and understanding the human gene genome. And also <laughs> um, genes can be uh, like mixed and matched as well. So that's 20,000 unique proteins, but you could take two genes and kind of mix them together and then you get a new protein. Uh, and so then that number starts to you know it's, it's in the millions uh, in reality um so um the problem then is all of the things that we think of when we think about biology my arm for example that's not one pro uh, protein and therefore one gene that's like thousands and thousands and thousands of genes all working together so if i wanted to in the sci-fi sense grow myself an extra arm that's not something that genetics can do yet because it wouldn't be like I can just like add an extra gene for an, for arm. That's not how it works. Um, nor is it like, oh, we'll just add an extra gene that makes you smart um, because intelligence is also the, the 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 result of like thousands and thousands and thousands of unique proteins working together, and therefore thousands and thousands of unique genes working together, all of which you would need to modify in order to produce. Um, you know the the outcomes uh and that me also therefore means that there is no single gene for any uh I, I don't know why i wrote macroscopic here just like anything that you can observe about a person their limbs their eye color their intelligence their personality their race none of that stuff is a single gene um it's usually the result of like many 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 genes uh, interacting with one another uh, so yeah, so what that means is we are a long way away from, you know, the the imagination of most people as to what genetic engineering really means. But we're using it in lots of really, really cool ways already. Um, so I don't know how many people know this, but if you know anyone or you have diabetes and you take insulin, that's thanks to genetic engineering. We, we took bacteria that didn't produce, so insulin is a protein, by the way. Um, so we took bacteria that didn't make insulin, and we added the gene for insulin in, and the bacteria grow very fast and therefore produce lots of insulin very quickly. Um, that's how we're able to mass, like if we needed to just make insulin from like from scratch, we would, it would cost like millions of dollars per injection. Um, but the fact that we can get like nature to do it for us just through genetic engineering is why, you know, diabetes isn't a death sentence. Um, also, uh, you know, making modifying cells to produce extra molecules is something we can do because that's something one protein does. So we added the protein that produces vitamin A into rice. And I like maybe people have heard of golden rice. Um, it's basically rice that uh, corrected for the vitamin deficiencies. So um, like, yeah, lots of cool stuff that's being done, but it, it tends to be very simple. Um, we're really limited in terms of humans because it's not ethical to just like take a bunch of people and start 
messing around with their genes and seeing what happens because the answer most of the time is going to be they'll die horribly um that most of our test subjects in the long scientific process of genetic uh, engineering uh, most of our experiments have ended with some mouse or you know cat or something dying of like some horrible genetic disorder um but through that process we've uh learned how to correct a lot of genetic disorders because it if a lot of things that go wrong with humans are the result of just one gene going wrong. And so while it's very difficult to make your genes do a new thing, it's quite easy to fix one thing they did wrong. Um, the future of this, though, is overlapping with um, machine learning and statistics. So we may not be able to look at one gene and say this gene does this, but a machine learning algorithm can definitely easily process 20,000 genes and make predictions. So um, hopefully you can see that the fields like merge in a very important way at the point at which we know all of the genes in a person and we can do, you know, you can take like a genetic database of 50,000 people and you can measure their IQ, for example, and then a machine learning algorithm can go, all right, so scanning the genes, predicting IQ, these set of genes will raise your IQ. That's the kind of things that machine learning can do. Um, and so while I said that it's not possible to do it now, it will be one day. Um, but even, yeah, even with the limited power of genetic engineering so far, we're already dealing with lots of um, risks and ethical dilemmas. So as I said, fixing disorders is something that genetic engineering is very good at already. Um, it's quite likely, for example, that we may be able to fix uh, neurodivergent traits like autism, ADHD, Down syndrome, we kind of already can. Um, is that ethical? Uh, is it acceptable to essentially wipe out like an entire type of person um, because we consider it to be, you know, a, a disease or a dysfunction? Um, is that a choice that we as society can make or is that a choice that parents should make given that they'll be the ones who have to raise the children? Um, don't know. Uh, it's, it's a, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a question that not only is society going to have to grapple with quite soon because designer babies, not in the sense of I'm going to create myself a perfect child, but simply in the sense of your doctor will, you know, turn to you after your ultrasound and say, uh, your child is 25% risk of developing autism. Do you want this quick, easy genetic fix that makes sure they'll never have autism? What would you do in that situation? No, there's no right or wrong answers here, um, which is why. There are definitely debates still to be had. Um, what if it's something that we don't consider to be, uh, you know, like Huntington's is just, there's lots of genetic disorders that are just awful and we want to fix them. Okay, but a lot of these therapies are very, very expensive. Is it acceptable to allow lots of people to suffer by virtue of the fact that it's just the technology is expensive? Um, Probably that's not a good reason to ban it, but it's certainly a good reason to want to control it um, because that's the first step. The second step is once we do get to the stage of being able to modify intelligence, height, life expectancy, um, we'll then deal with two problems. We'll deal with the problem of, well, rich people will have like not just the advantage of having money and capital, but... Uh, Sorry, one second. Um, but also of, you know, literally being biologically better. Um, anyway, yeah, it's cool. So um, just that the, if you're wondering what the images are on the right, uh, the middle one is they were able to change the color of mice by altering their genes. Um, we know a lot more about mice than people. Don't worry, we're a long way away from being able to modify people's races, thankfully. Um, that's a nightmarish debate to be had. Thankfully, I don't think anyone will set that. Uh, slightly more fun and lighthearted. Uh, the pig on the left glows in the dark. <laughs> no, no joke. The, the gene for making things glow in the dark is very simple. So scientists love just making random living things glow in the dark because it's harmless and it's kind of funny. Um, but yeah, uh, it, will it be acceptable if people want to modify you know, ethnic traits? Is that their choice or are they affecting society by doing that? All right. This is the nightmare fuel. Uh, this is the stuff that's going to haunt you at night. Uh, sorry, but it's probably better that people know. 
Um, okay, so the the science of genetic engineering is getting much cheaper, uh, and it's getting much easier, and we're getting very good at it. Here's the problem: COVID nineteen, not the first coronavirus, um, and it's closely related to SARS, a virus that uh, hit Asia in the early two thousands. It was quite uh, was was terrifying at the time, but ultimately killed about two thousand people, and then was contained. Um, but the the you know the classic image of coronavirus with these things sticking out they're called spike proteins and they, they they fit near perfectly into the human cell um, which makes it very very infectious and that's one gene that spike protein is one gene so if i found a more deadly coronavirus than covid because remember it's its fatality rate is actually pretty low it's, it's terrifying because it spread so quickly but it, in terms of the percentage of people it kills sars was like two percent of people who got infected dies covid is like 0.5 percent but if I took the old SARS and I added the spike protein to it, now you've got COVID, but it kills four times as many people. And I could do that in my garage, basically. Not me personally, I don't know how to do this stuff, but like the technology exists. Um, probably government's already doing it. Uh, it won't be too long until a particularly evil PhD student working on their PhD in genetic engineering could create a bioweapon before their supervisor got back and noticed what was going on. And even worse, it's much quicker to modify the genes of a virus than it is to make a vaccine for it. Uh, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, so if I wanted to, I could basically, well, not me, because as I say, I'm not a biochemist, and I'm saying this to also exempt myself from any legal problems, but, um, if someone had a lab and had the resources, they could once a week, brand new, deadly virus. Uh, you'll never catch up. Um, and uh, uh, literally um, uh, a lab in Canada did this just to prove to the government that it was a threat that they needed to take seriously. They made a, 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 a bacteria that was immune to every single antibiotic known to man. They killed it immediately afterwards, but they were like, someone could make this and dump it in the water supply and we would have no medicine that could deal with it. The only thing that's stopping this from happening so far is that thankfully uh, terrorists don't have access to genetic sequencing equipment. So that stays that way. Uh, cool, all right. Um, I'm gonna speed through this one because this is going on for longer than I thought. Um, okay, blockchain, cryptocurrency. You know what, actually, I'm just gonna skip this one. Uh, the slides will be released. It's a pretty comprehensive explanation of blockchain and cryptocurrency. You use it to buy illegal stuff. I think cryptocurrencies are the dumbest thing possible. Um, with, you can read the explanation when I release the slides, but basically it's money, but it's anonymous and you can sp like spend it on anything basically. Obviously people use it to buy drugs, guns, stolen artwork, child pornography, anything else they don't want the government knowing about. Um, most of the time though people don't spend it they hoard it because they think it's going to be worth more money in the future i couldn't give i couldn't care less if it's not for the fact that it uses massive amounts of computation uh, computational power and therefore uh electricity um to give you a scale uh, like a, a like bear in mind bitcoin isn't even the only cryptocurrency at this point it's just the biggest one and not even by uh it, it's just slightly the biggest one bitcoin alone uh uses let me see it currently, as of today, uh, Bitcoin mining uses the same amount of power as Kazakhstan. Uh, within the next year, assuming nothing radical changes, Bitcoin mining will use more electricity than the whole of Pakistan. Scientists have predicted that like, we've set back global warming efforts by half a degree, just thanks to cryptocurrencies. Um, that's how much energy they use. Uh, it's seriously the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. Um, and people are like, ah, oh, you know, it's going to change the economy. Yeah, it'll let you buy illegal stuff. Uh, there are there are legitimate uses for it. Like, I think I say in this one, like, if, you know, if you're in a corrupt government where they're likely to steal your money if you flee the country, it's quite useful to have money they can't steal. But like, I just, I just think cryptocurrency is the stupidest thing possible. Dogecoin is now like as a market cap of like 123 billion as of no sorry 12.3 billion as of yesterday or something. It's really stupid. Um, all right, let's uh, let's quickly delve into um, 
know, we talked about the science. Let's talk about uh, what to do in prep, the debating stuff. Uh, cool. So the first thing, because it might be one of the, the, the technologies that I talked about, or it might be one that you already knew about because it wasn't super rare. And then they added a twist to it, or it might be a totally sci-fi technology. The first thing that you need to figure out um, is what does that technology mean? I.e., if I say the word cryptocurrency, uh, what you need to be doing is in prep very quickly, stripping away the word cryptocurrency and replacing it with anonymous currency that can't be tracked by governments. If I say the words like, um, uh, you know, um, facial recognition uh, through machine learning, you need to be saying to yourself in prep uh, the ability to track people anywhere they go. What you need to always be doing is not get bogged down in the details of the, what the technology is, how it works, who, like, you, you know, stuff like that is going to be important. But the first thing you need to figure out is, like, what does the technology mean in terms of, like, actually, like, what does it change uh, beyond the status quo? And you need to figure that out quickly because your arguments should come not from what the technology, like what you can infer from it, but what the fundamental thing that it changes, what that means. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, what that means. Once you know what it means, what the technology means, uh, then you need to figure out what it does. And the reason you do it in that order um, is because uh, do, do, do. is the mechanism of Bitcoin operating government? Could you um, unmute and uh, like ask the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, there was this motion related to how um, Japan has allowed cryptocurrencies to exist with Germany, but Bitcoin as well to function to some extent. So like, understanding that the sort of like decentralization is like still limited to some extent. Is it still that much harmful? Uh, so there's lots of there's lots of different cryptocurrencies. And I think the thing you're referring to, if I remember correctly, the Bank of Japan wants to make their own cryptocurrency, yeah, which yeah, they yeah. would control. Um, the idea being that, it, it, to me, it seems very stupid, right? People are buying cryptocurrencies because they want to avoid governments. And governments keep, like the Chinese government said they were going to make uh, uh, their own cryptocurrency. The Japanese government, uh, three days ago, the British government said they're going to make a cryptocurrency. Like no one's going to buy them because <laughs> the thing they want from cryptocurrencies is the anonymity. Uh, like I, the whole thing seems very stupid to me. Also, don't feel guilty about mining uh, Dogecoin. I'm mining Ethereum right now. Like it's stupid, but it's not going to stop me making money. Um, and I'm like, you know, a rounding error on the uh, ecological catastrophe that's um, being caused. So I feel very little guilt. Uh, governments just ban them is my opinion, but... You can hear me rant about Bitcoin some other time. Um, all right, cool. So figure out what the technology means without the, the fancy words. Figure out what it, what it changes over the status quo. Once you know that, then figure out what it does. Um, because what you want them want to be doing is saying, what else creates this same change? Um, and a lot of what I'm saying here is going to apply more so on Gov, I think, a lot of the time, uh, when you are like saying you should ban a technology or you should restrict a technology. Um, I'm going to give you some examples of this, but you, you want to be looking for things that it's similar to and what they did to help you both as examples, but also to help you analyze why this new technology will create the change that you claim that it will. Um, or alternatively, if you're defending the technology, what problems it might solve. So if you were talking about genetic engineering, uh, you can say, well, it fixes mistakes in our genetics. That's what medicine does. This is like medicine, but much more powerful. That's what I would be saying in prep right off the bat. Um, and therefore, uh, you know, we're simplifying the, the, the science side of the debate in order so that we can debate that core question that I posited, at the, well, that, that I was flagging at the beginning, which is the, the, the principles of, of the technology. Um, and then to do that, we need to know what problems it solves or what problems it creates. And then of course, the third step then is once you have that list of problems and ideally you have something that connects them all as a principle and and i don't mean principle here as in you rant about kant for or hegel for five minutes i mean uh, you have some like foundational belief like privacy is something worth protecting and this technology will undermine privacy uh 
people's autonomy, their ability to make free choices is important. This technology will limit people's ability to make free choices, to, to oppose authoritarian governments. Whatever it is, you need to find something foundational instead of just like listing things that will change. Ideally, if you can't think of something, list things that will change, that's fine. Um, I'm just saying like the goal is always to have that, that one concrete theme that ties the entirety of, of the, the, the pros and cons of the technology together and explain why that, that thing is too important to be ignored. I'm going to give you examples in a second um, because then that is the what should we do will of course depend on the motion. If the motion is this house supports, um, then you want to be saying like the most urgent problem in the world right now is this and this technology is solving this problem in this way, something like that. Or if the motion is about banning, well, um, we're going to get into strategy now. Um, I always mistime my... Um, Oh, I just said all that. Cool. Uh, I always mistime my talks. So uh, this part is going to end up being quicker than I wanted. All right. Uh, what I call the three framing weapons of mass destruction in all science and technology debates, um, which go pick up this presentation afterwards, read through these slides and memorize these because you are going to end up using them in more debates than you can possibly imagine. Um, the first, Pandora's box. Uh, if you're not familiar with the story, there was a box. Pa Pandora owned it. She was told by a god, don't open it. It contains all the evil in the world. She was too curious. She opened the box. The evil flew, all flew out. She was like, oh no, but she can't put the evil back in the box. <laughs> um, the reason why that applies to science and technology debates uniquely is that information can be copied uh, and cannot be contained. If I post my code for my AI on the internet, within 30 minutes, 50 people have copied it. If I a week later go like, actually, wait, crap, I've just realized it does something horrible, too late. It's all over the world right now. If I learn the genetic sequence for a particularly deadly viral mutation, and, and I publish that in a research paper, Russian scientists are already making it. Um, you, whenever you, it comes to anything to do with, I'm going to talk about this in slides, anyway, um, information asymmetry. Uh, if your response in any debate is, it's okay, we'll regulate it. Remember that regulation is reactive. So uh, someone makes some sign, like remember the thing I talked about the vaccines, right? If your response to, let's say the motion was this house would ban all research into genetic engineering. And you would, you would provide the example I described of like the dangers of uh, virus technology and how genetic engineering allows us to essentially weaponize nature um, it, it, by exploiting the vulnerabilities of, you know, our fleshy biological bodies and that's foundational in the sense of um nature is exists in a very careful balance and we would we can interfere with it and create massive harms very quickly um and therefore it's not okay to just say well there's no need to ban genetic engineering we'll just ban the bad uses of it because we won't know what the bad uses are until smallpox is back and has infected half of the world uh, or whatever it is right so um information asymmetry is just the idea that the person making the science and the technology knows more about it than the government's trying to deal with it um this last one is shelling points i don't think anyone will have heard of it's quite niche um but it, it's such a clever idea that's so useful in so many debates um it's basically like well, let me, when I go through the slides, I'll cover it. Okay, so lots of debates about technology and science talk about regulation. And the question that you'll typically need to answer if you're on the side, and this is what I said at the beginning when someone was joking about OO, so many motions are like, this house would ban this technology or this house would ban the research in, into this technology. Let's say this house would ban research into AI. Gov stand up and like, oh, I can do this bad thing and this bad thing. Op stand up and be like, it can literally save millions of people a year from dying from like famines and, and natural disasters. We save more lives, you lose. Um, that is a very bad way to approach that debate. Uh, pointing out that uh, Cambridge Analytica only got a modicum of regulation years after they'd already manipulated something like 30 elections around the world. Governments are always gonna be slow to respond because they're not the ones driving change, they're responding to change. Uh, and so that's why that's like your basic level of explaining why it is that we can't just regulate away the bad stuff and keep it good, because that's ultimately what opposition teams will try and do in debates like this. They'll regulate away the bad, keep all the good. 
you need to beat that to win the debate. And therefore, you need to be ready always with an answer of why it is that we are banning something rather than just like banning the bad versions of it. Um, yeah, what the slide says. There's a time lag to decision making in governments. It's actually quite slow. That means regulation never keeps up. Uh, I already talked about Pandora's box. Uh, so the, the, the significance of this is I don't know if the guy who invented Bitcoin feels guilty that he's technology now consumes more power than Kazakhstan uh, for no purpose at all. Um, but nonetheless, uh, as soon as a piece of technology is out in the wild, anyone can copy it. Um, there are obviously exceptions to this, right? We wouldn't have a debate about banning research, for example, into fighter jets because, um, cool, if you get the blueprints for like an F-35. It's not like you can build one in your garage. Um, but a lot of the technologies that I've talked about in this talk and the ones that form the basis of interesting debates are ones that people can do soon quite cheaply. And therefore the knowledge is what's dangerous, not the technology itself. It's an important distinction that you want to use in your framing, like right in your PM speech, or maybe you're, you're, you're giving the member speech that's the PM speech that should have happened. And that's the framing that you're going to use. And that's why I call it a weapon of mass destruction, because it's like, as soon as you put, point this out to judges, the whole conception of the debate has to change very quickly because it's, it's no longer the question of what will we use it for? It's what could people use it for? Okay, uh, shelling points um, with connected concepts of arms races and path dependency. Uh, cool. So there are, we all know the slippery slope, right? Uh, or the, the, the fact that people tell you that you shouldn't use slippery slope arguments. Um, but there are instances where the technologies that we create or the scientific innovations that we pursue actually change our ability to control them later on. So if you're confused by that, a really a good example is uh, social media. Probably a lot of us know that social media is really bad for our mental health. We know that it's our data is being used and is undermining our privacy and is being used to sell us things we don't want and to convince us to vote in ways that aren't good for us, whatever. But we're stuck because it's a network effect. All your friends use social media, so you use social media. Um, you feel powerless to, to do anything about it because you've become changed by the technology. It's literally rewired your brain to make you continue using it. And so if you were to go back in time, you would not say, well, it has all these potential benefits. You would probably weigh the benefits less importantly than the fact that the choice to start using social media might be irreversible. That's one arm of it. The other arm is that, well, social media now maybe can't even be regulated because if a government seriously went after Facebook or Apple or Google to the point of like, changing their business model and note the business model relies upon privacy uh, or violating privacy well do you want to be the politician that facebook weaponizes all of the data that they've accumulated to make sure that you specifically don't win even if they don't explicitly ever do this the mere threat that they can do this makes it very hard for governments to respond now like big tech companies might be more powerful than world governments um and this therefore is a consideration of if we're having a debate about like this house regrets Facebook, it would be very powerful to say at the start of like the very first step before we'd ever, you know, delved into social media, um, those benefits would not have, if we knew what was coming, those benefits might not have looked worthwhile. And therefore we should weigh the potential uh, big risks associated quite heavily. Um, there's an, another problem often, which is uh, that sometimes technologies don't have these like catastrophic consequences but they do have costs um and then the problem is if technology becomes wide if it gives it everyone an advantage uh and then it becomes widespread it's no longer an advantage uh the, it's very hard to explain this you'll recognize it when you see it but i think the best example that's familiar to us is makeup if no one wore makeup no one would judge like no one would ever say to a person not wearing makeup oh, you look ill today, or oh, you look different, or whatever, right? Which then creates the sort of feeling of being trapped, of like feeling like you have to wear makeup, like people talk about needing to wear makeup because they feel, I mean, predominantly women, there's a lot of sexism wrapped up in this. I'm not glossing over that. But my point is like, people say that they they feel like people are staring at them or they, they feel like, you know, they can't go out if they're not wearing makeup. Um, but if everyone wears makeup, then you're just, you're just at like, 
you're back where you started we've gained nothing um but we've a lot of cost has gone into that same with genetic engineering um and potentially also like eventually if every company in the world is using machine learning algorithms to better market products they're not selling any more products you can't convince people to spend money they don't have but now lots of money is being spent on machine learning algorithms which you need to compete with other companies and therefore you're back at ground zero there's no we've gained nothing from all of that investment some companies got a temporary advantage other companies caught up and we've just had a lot of wasted effort um yeah so the, the way you make these argue, so the way you make these arguments is essentially you say look we are here at point x we do y y might be good but if we do y z could happen and z's really bad if doing y makes z more likely the good of y doesn't matter so uh the let's look at this example down here right this house supports the widespread introduction of public facial recognition tracking technology the thing i would be characterizing here uh, is like once upon a time we didn't think about privacy because there was no way for people to violate our privacy we we didn't like no, there, there was no concept of the government are reading my Facebook messages, the CCTV cameras on the streets watch me everywhere I go, that I have a GPS tracker on me at all times. You didn't think about like the government monitoring you or having the ability to monitor you all the time and therefore it couldn't affect your behavior. But then of course now we are all, this is the reality we live in where no one is untrackable unless they actively choose to be and give up a lot in the process. But we've now become used to being trackable so we stop thinking about it so that means each new like you know like wearable technologies like cameras in your home that like order uh, to be fair actually i realize when as i'm saying this a lot of this is probably just like bougie american crap um i don't have any of the amazon smart devices but you can get like a button in your toilet that you you, you shout like i'm out of toilet paper or something it orders more toilet paper from amazon it's like cool all right it's convenient but now you have a microphone that gives amazon the ability to listen to your conversations all over your house um that's insane but we've gotten used to it and we each step we take down the slippery slope prevents us from um realizing that that we're sort of speeding up towards some some dark outcome uh so uh what this means of course is that um the best way to stop this is not to say, OK, well, we'll we'll keep doing the, the technology, we'll keep introducing the technology. And then if we see it starting to go bad, we'll stop because if we won't be able to stop at that point, something will stop us from going backwards. Um, so instead, what we should do, and this is what a shelling point is, is just say. Flag goes in the ground here. I don't know if things were better back there because we can't go back. I know that things can get really bad ahead of us. What we need to do is stop now because we can see the bad thing coming but we won't know that it, we're past the point of no return until we get there so this motion here this house supports the widespread introduction of public facial recognition and tracking technology I, I don't imagine this will get set but it's a nice example um it would be pretty cool to never worry about terrorism again because like machine learning algorithms could instantly um you know pick out a person as soon as they walk out in public and like immediately secret service descends upon them and you know we never have to work or crime or anything else right we could probably solve all of that if there was cameras on every corner uh watching people and identifying them but it would make it really hard like if an evil government got into power um and used this to track down revolutionaries and dissidents they would basically be undefeatable uh so then the question you have to ask is are we so scared of the small number of people that die at the hands of terrorists or suffer at the hands of criminals that we are willing to risk the concept of a government that could never be overthrown if they didn't choose to be? Uh, that's what I mean by like the so the shelling point is just to say, no, we'll accept the harms that exist now. Yes, things could get better if we introduced a, a little bit more facial recognition technology, but that will edge us closer to that point of no return. Therefore, this is why we stop now. Cool. Um, so I was going to go through some motions, um, but I think if you go back and read the slides and then read the motions, these will be good practices. They also illustrate uh, 
what I was saying about um, these motions come up a lot at big, big competitions. Um, Cambridge IV, Euros. I, I honestly don't remember. I think this was AVP or something. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know if anyone did pre-career, literally exactly what I've been talking about today. So um, thank you for thank you for listening. Uh, I hope this is useful. I uh, also hope see the recording worked so that uh, other people can watch it. Actually, before we part, uh, does anyone have any burning questions that they wanted about absolutely anything that's been covered so far? I'm more than happy to uh, chill for about another five minutes. Um, in terms of AI debates, is it better to establish counterfactuals or is it better to claim trade, trade harms versus benefits that the other side is already? Because like usually the harm is that humanity is literally going to be destroyed. In terms of ethics, do you counter do you establish a counterfactual that a better uh, a strategy or just engaging with the harms versus benefits? So I think it would depend on the the nuances, right? Because I, I think if a team claims that humanity is going to be destroyed without AI, it's probably a little bit far-fetched um, and, and that you would need to just look, look into the details of what it is they're saying and something won't add up um, because humanity survived for a very long time without AI. Presumably, it, it, like it's a high burden to set yourself to say without it, we're all going to die. We can probably survive just fine without it. Um, but if they have a genuine claim like that, and you instead want to make a more like okay <laughs> this is going to be a really ridiculous sound really ridiculous but i swear to god i want to debate with this and like i don't know maybe it's not the thing i would do if it was like a semi-final of a competition i really wanted to make the final but i think this was a good example even if it's a bit extreme of of how you can overcome even the most apocalyptic arguments so remember what i said about ai sufficiently advanced ai being um like functionally alive and sentient and therefore potentially being deserving of rights well i gave an extension that was like it's not potential they are literally deserving of rights uh you know we 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 can't discriminate just on the basis of the the atoms that form up a sentient conscious moral being that is totally unjust if we don't ban the development of ai though then companies are going to create generalized AIs and they're going to use them and then probably not going to pay them or give them holidays or sick leave, um, whatever AI sickness is. In fact, what we're going to functionally have there is a situation of slavery. Uh, in the same way, therefore, as uh, Union soldiers in, in you know, the, the, the uh, well, it wasn't the United States of America in whatever it was called at the time, you know, People were literally willing to oops, World War II, whatever you know, dramatic world event has occurred in in your part of the world, where people literally went to fight, knowing that they might die, knowing that a lot of them might die, but ultimately they believed that something was worth dying for. If it so happens that the only way to save humanity is to bring back slavery in the form of AI, so be it. Let humanity die. Um, you don't necessarily need to go that extreme. I told you it was a, it was an out there example right but it may be that like um genetic engineering can solve loads of you know unpleasant disorders um but in doing so you know we might like create the ability to essentially eradicate entire groups of people for example autism or adhd it's quite easy to make a case that if you you know if you've, you've done your homework and you know how to make the analysis persuasively and you know you bang your fist on the table a little bit as you give your speech and you really like make it seem like you care about what you're saying I think it's, it's one, a perfectly valid debate strategy to just say, yeah, people are going to die. Some things are worth like sacrificing some lives for because there's more to like, there's, there's more to the way that we think of society than just making sure that more people live than did yesterday. Like society has to be worth living for essentially. Um, and a society that just like commits genocide against people because they are inconvenient uh, is not a society worth defending, even if we save couple of hundred more people's lives a year by genetic engineering. So that's kind of how you want to be like, yeah, if, if, if the opposition have proven that it's going to end the world, fuck it, go nuts. Like slavery is coming back, guys, and we're going to stop it on our side. Meet them with something equally crazy. Most of the time, they're not going to have actually proven the apocalypse, is my opinion. Or the CA's just picked really stupid motions. Like that's possible too.
All right, cool. Any other questions? Also, did that answer your question? Sorry, I was on a ramble there. Uh, yep, I did. I've seen a lot of debates where people just go without proving that the apocalypse is coming, but they just assume it does. I don't know. And that's usually banned debates. And the judge to credit them on that. So it's like really confused about that. But yeah, that explains a lot. Actually, the thing I said at the beginning is the rebuttal. Like, if you don't know the detail, like, I don't know. If you don't know enough about AI to explain some team just like, what's the, like trampled the judges with loads of like jargon because they're computer science students. Um, and you don't know how to rebut them because you don't understand what they just said. I mean, one, point that out, <laughs> like the average informed voter standard applies in all of these debates. But two, if their claim is we can't survive without this new technology, what you want to be doing is saying, one, we survived without it in the past. Two, pick some other technology that can do something similar and use that. So like, Sure, maybe if we ban machine learning, we won't be able to predict storms as effectively. I guess we'll just have to spend the vast amounts of money that we spent on researching machine learning on building big, like stronger houses for people further inland, stuff like that. Um, you can always come up with some other solution to the problems because like, there's very few cases of science actually being totally critical for saving the day. That's, I think, the best way to approach this kind of uh, situation in a debate. Cool. Um, time for one more question if anyone has one, otherwise I'm gonna end the recording. Hello, yeah, I have a question. So, so we discussed about the production and the expense of the vaccines, right? So don't you think it's, it puts us in a spot where it is important for us to consider the efficacy of such vaccines? I mean, what about if people still get affected with COVID-19 despite getting um, vaccinated? Um, so actually this isn't like, I, it's probably not debate relevant, but it's, it's an interesting question because um, the, I think that, you know, it's very hard to explain the, the complexities of how immunology, like vaccines and how this stuff works um, because the number 98% effective is actually quite misleading. If you look at like, I don't know, people over the age of 95, it's probably like 50% effective. 50% of them are still gonna die even with a vaccine if they get infected. Um, if you look at very young people, it was already 98% effective. Like your chance of dying as a young person from COVID was already basically zero. Um, so the number is misleading. Um, but the thing that is really important to, uh, about vaccines is that even the least efficacious ones, so like, uh, I think it's called Sinovac, the Chinese uh, produced vaccine. Uh, I don't know about the Russian one because I don't trust anything that the Russians have their vaccine. It's called Sputnik. I honestly just don't trust the data that they produce it enough to like confidently say it does or doesn't work. Um, but the Chinese one is, is uh, you know, there's lots of good universities in China, lots of good research being done. Um, we know quite a lot about how it, how it was developed, etc. Um, it's not as effective as the Pfizer vaccine or the Johnson & Johnson or the AstraZeneca one. As far as I'm aware, I've not been following this, like, on a daily basis. There's lots of new findings coming out. Um, and I don't know the statistics, but let's say it's like 75% effective. What's really important to understand, though, is that that doesn't mean the 25% died. It just means that they weren't completely immunized from the virus so what they what we've seen so in israel for example they've now vaccinated functionally everyone and covid deaths have dropped to zero people are still going to hospital but what remember I, well uh, i went through it quite quickly but i said that you can have both different lengths of immune response but also different intensities of immune response so it may now be that um you know in the percentage of people where the vaccine's not perfectly effective their immune system still takes a couple of days to respond, but that's a lot better than it taking a couple of weeks to respond and then dying in the meantime. So a lot of what we're seeing is even the worst vaccines are uh, preventing people from dying because they prevented the, the infection from ever getting so serious um, that it puts them at like serious risk. Uh, so strains aside, variants aside, uh, like I think the vaccines are, are mostly going to work even the non-Pfizer ones I don't know in Europe at least the, the, there's like this perception that the Pfizer vaccine is the only one that works and all the others suck that's not true um, all of them are better than nothing at this point point. Um, and the fact that we have lots of different countries producing lots of very cheap and 
different useful vaccines is a like pretty impressive moment in world um, pharmaceutical history or whatever. Um, like we've never produced a vaccine for a, a, a virus this complicated in the space of a year before in human history. This is unprecedented. So um, like good job science. Uh, I've made this talk really depressing and apocalyptic because that's what debating tends to be about. But like, look around you, the world is getting better in many ways. Um, and science is driving a lot of that. And by and large, um, you know, I, I've focused on the negatives because the positives are easier for you to conclude once you understand how these things work. But yeah, um, right, I'm gonna have to run off now because I'm doing a debate in five minutes. Uh, so I'm ending the recording there.